Well, on that note, let me try and thoroughly oh explain this. This one is uh, such a beast, too. Oh, my gosh. Oof. Good luck, okay, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't know if I uh, fully understand this one. To be honest, we should have, it's, it's, we should have taken bets in advance. Like, all right, <laughs> how many out of how many? So we each have five, right? How many out of five are we going to be able to successfully get a passing grade on? Like, <laughs> So I think I think I'm gonna start this one off with a song, Joel. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> we're gonna get copyright strike. It's the most seconds. wonderful time. Oh, now we're definitely getting copyright strike. <laughs> it's the top ten web hacking techniques of 2023 by Port Swigger Research episode. Oh yeah, it's gonna this be. It's gonna be a good one. I'm really excited. Yeah, dude, it is gonna be a good one. But let me say, I am. Well, for, before before I talk about myself, where are you right now, Joel? Because you look like you're in a dungeon. I, <laughs> I basically am. I'm in uh, in my parents' uh, basement. Unfinished uh, basement. Yeah, unfinished basement. This house is uh, like 250 years old. So oh my it's, gosh, uh, it's it's like old school basement. Wow, um, dude. But yeah, I uh, I drove from California to uh, the East Coast to I guess I'll. Should I say? No, Which just, just, you can leave that out. I'll for just now. say East Coast. Yeah. yeah um, but uh, yeah, I'm moving into a new house. We're closing soon. And um, yeah, it's pretty exciting. Nice, man. Um, super pumped. Well, I, I saw the, the Zillow listing for your house. It looks awesome. And soon you'll be not in a dungeon, but in a mansion. Yes. Yeah. Well, a mansion is a. <laughs> yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe we'll, uh, you know, just like contrast, contrastarily. <laughs> they're they're gonna think I'm I'm loaded with bounties. <laughs> it's all from that uh, you know critical thinking money is what it is. Oh yeah, yeah, oh yeah, yeah. I got mansion money. We're now. just we're just loaded from doing this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, uh, cool. Well, yeah, like you said, dude, it's gonna be one heck of an episode. Essentially, what we tried to do last year and what we're gonna attempt to do again this year is cover all of the top ten web hacking techniques of 2023. Um, which Portswigger releases, they do sort of like a competition every year. And, uh, you know, the community votes on the top hacking techniques. And uh, all of these are amazing pieces of research and are extremely technically dense. <laughs> um, yeah. And so for the past, I don't know, it's probably taken me 10 hours or so to read through everything and fully understand and prepare a document and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and and... And so uh, we're going to try to condense it down to pretty much what you need to know, the tricks and tips and, uh, you know, assuming a base level knowledge of, uh, you know, hacking techniques, what is, what are the things about these specific pieces of research that stand out? Um, and we'll try to condense that into, into one episode. Do you think we can do it, Joel? I don't know. <laughs> Uh, we're gonna we're gonna try, you know. This, uh, yeah, I was reading through some of these, and uh, they are really, really deep reads. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, even if we explain it well, I think uh, everybody should still probably go read them all individually. Yeah, yeah. Disclaimer: We are gonna skip number two. Dot net serialization. What, what is it called? Exploiting hardened dot net deserialization because it is a 124 page white paper <laughs> that J Justin sent me this document. He's like, "Hey, uh, can you just like read through these and make sure that they're like summarized?" And so I I picked the first one that's assigned to me, and I open it up, and it's a GitHub link to a PDF, and I was like, "Oh." you know this uh this looks good and i download it and i open it up and it's page one of 124 <laughs> and i was like i sent him a picture i was like did you know that this is a 124 page white paper and he was like wait seriously i did i did not know that <laughs> i did not know that so you know we're, we're gonna skip that one but i think you know the rest of them we should be able to speak to fairly well um yeah yeah so. absolutely Let's let's get into it, man. First up is number one. We're gonna start from number one this year. I don't know. Did we start from number ten last year? I feel like we did. I don't know, but I'm yeah. gonna do it in whatever order it's in the doc, which I think is the same order that's on the the, the yeah. post. Yeah, they are. This is right? the the placing yeah. order. So number one, and it was kind of funny if you actually click the link to to go and look at the actual 
Portswigger research, you know, the top 10 web hacking techniques of 2023 research. There's like a description for each one of them. And number one, obviously, James is the one that kind of puts this on, James Kettle. And then he's, you know, his <laughs> one number one, uh, as as it should, because it's amazing research. And so he says, in the beginning of the, the description for that, he says, well, this is awkward. I always knew that there was a risk of rating research when I also published it myself. And after seven years, it finally happened. I now have to <laughs> declare that my own research is the best. <laughs> James, we all knew your research was the best. Your, your research has always been the best. Um, it wasn't really a question. <laughs> no, really. Uh, kind of crazy. Um, but yeah, so he released some research this year, James did, James Kettle, and he releases research every year. And I always make a habit, I always make a habit of trying to read it as soon as possible. Um, because oftentimes he's highlighting systemic issues that can be exploited in lots of different environments. Um, and so I always make a habit of reading this right off the bat. So I've, I've read through this multiple times before now. This is my, my third or fourth time through it. Um, and this is a particularly simple, to be perfectly honest, uh, exploit that, that James kind of came out with this year. It, it takes some uh, pieces of research from two different researchers and some of his own research from the past, uh, combines it together with some features of HTTP2 and creates this super awesome technique, which is like now the go-to technique for um, for race conditioning uh, uh, testing in the browser or in the uh, in web applications. Um, yeah. ha have, you, have you seen it? Joel, have you read through this whole thing? Well, yeah. So interestingly, this research is actually used in another one of the top 10. Um, oh, really? Uh, vulnerability. Yeah. So uh, so I'll, I'll let you cover it because it, I think it'll make the net, the, the other bug make a little more cool. sense. I, I, I didn't get the chance to read through all of the ones that you that you that we assigned to you. Um, so I'm interested in hearing about it, too. But essentially, to summarize this research, um, James figured out a way to abuse Nagel's algorithm, which is sort of like a TCP algorithm that uh, is used in, to optimize TCP packets being sent um, so that there isn't like a bunch of TCP metadata and then like one byte of data um, in conjunction with HTTP2, uh, in conjunction with the last byte sync um, sort of idea that he had from a couple years back on getting um, race conditions to align. And essentially, the the new thing is he utilizes HTTP2, which can send multiple um, uh, sort of HTTP requests streamed together um, in a single TCP packet. Um, and then essentially, he only, he used, in one TCP packet, he uses, he puts the last byte and sometimes the, um, the, the last byte in the end stream uh, frame for the HTTP2 sort of structure um, in the same TCP packets for, for a bunch of different HTTP requests. So stream most of the body for all the HTTP requests, save the last byte and the uh, end stream frame, um, and then send those all at once. And that will complete all of those HTTP requests all at once and essentially get your uh, hit times for these requests down to sub one millisecond, uh, allowing for very effective race conditions to be achieved. Amazing technique, absolutely mind boggling. Super, super interesting. Uh, I misspoke. <laughs> this is a different piece of albino wax research. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, no. So, uh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll explain uh, my other one uh, when I get to there. But yeah, no, this is, uh, I mean, one of the things that I really love about James's mm. research is that he approaches things from like a fundamental level, right? He's mm -hmm. like, for, for a long time, he was looking at like, you know, HTTP smuggling mm -hmm. and, and desyncing mm -hmm. and all that kind of stuff and like attacking like the layer, what is it, layer three, layer four, um, the, you know, um, level, you know, HTTP servers and all that kind of stuff. And then uh, now he's he's at like, TCP layer, which is like yeah. um, so so close to like, I mean, next the next uh, albino wax, uh, you know, research is going to be plugging in an Ethernet. He's going to be like, and that's the MAC address <laughs> level. No, um, I, yeah. I do like that how he approaches it from a holistic perspective, and I also think that this specific write up. So the the concept is pretty pretty simple, you know, group the last byte for a bunch of HTTP requests into one TCP packet, um, you know, uh, with all this data being sent over HTTP2. So that's really cool. Um, and, and in the write-up, he does a really, a really good job of making the algorithm seem really simple. And um, he actually condenses it down to just a couple bullet points. So I'm just going to read it uh, word for word here. He says, um, 
excuse me, first pre-send the bulk of each request. If the request has no body, send all the headers and don't set the end stream flag. Sorry, flag. I, I said frame, but it's flag. And withhold an empty data frame with end stream set. If the request has a body, so that, that, that was with there's no body, then send the headers and all the body except the final byte, withhold a data frame containing the final byte, OK? Um, so that's all you've got to do. It's really easy to implement in, in various uh, different libraries as well. So this is something that I really, really like Kaido to implement. Um, or once we get a uh, sort of plug-in extensibility piece of Kaido, uh, I will really be looking forward to using this because I know Burp has a, a feature now where you can group a bunch of uh, tabs in Repeater into a group, and then you can right-click and hit Send in Parallel, and it will actually use the single packet methodology to send all of those together and synchronize them. And I just think that's such a beautiful, simple way to do race conditioning. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Maybe I maybe maybe this is somewhat related then, because the uh the the I'll talk about this book now. Are you? Are you? Uh, yeah, that's that that's your... about it for this one. I mean, just uh, the the takeaways for this one. I just want to highlight again is understanding, you know, this how it works, right, with the HGP two and um, sort of including only that last byte as well as the end stream um, flag as well, and then also just being able to do this in Burp, right, um, with with the uh, send in parallel. Those are the main sort of takeaways for this one, and allow you to also getting down to one one millisecond sort of time, which would really, really make, and this is also, no network jitter affects this because it's all hitting the server at the same time, which is uh, just revolutionary. So yeah, uh, th that's my, I've said my piece now. Where, where did you want to go with that next, Joel? Okay, so what I was going to say is, um, you know, so this next book also, this is a mm. number two, mm. sorry. Oh my gosh, <laughs> Joel, we're going to jump around. A, okay, what number is this? I know. Number, well, number two was uh, the 124 page white paper. Okay, okay, okay. The, uh, .NET serialization. So um, uh, I will jump around. I'm going to jump to number eight, yeah. uh, which is the from Akamai to F5 to, H, to NTLM with love. Um, now, this is a really, really cool bug. Um, it's uh, it's one of those bugs that you read through and you're like, wow, this sounds almost too simple to be true, mm. um, because essentially it is like textbook HTTP request smuggling. Mm. Um, they they were just doing a normal pen test. They were you know looking at this target. At the end of their test, they ran an HTTP HTTP smuggler scan through Burp, and uh, it came back with a bunch of findings. And I'm like, oh, that's kind of weird. Uh, you know, the, it looks like the trace method is uh, is being like processed by this backend server. Um, and there were a lot of references to Akamai and Akamai Edge servers. Mm. And so he did a bunch more testing and he noticed that indeed you, there was you know, a specific gadget that he was able to put together that you could um, put HTTP request smuggling through the Akamai Edge, directly, like directly attacking the Akamai Edge itself instead of like the customer servers underneath. But you would have the ability to attack you know, other proxies and stuff, right? And so... Um, because there are so many different possibilities, he initially found like right away, twenty five percent of the global caches could be poisoned through cache oh poisoning directly through the HTTP smuggling. So HTTP request smuggling into the Akamai Edge servers, and then from there, you can smuggle whatever you want. You can poison the cache of internal servers, the Akamai cache, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but then he also realized like, oh, well, I mean, big IP by F five, this is vulnerable to. Uh, you know, cache poisoning as well. A lot of people use big, big IP, especially behind Akamai. So he started scanning for through uh, Akamai using his vulnerability to find other big IP servers. And sure enough, like, you know, three quarters of the big IP uh, servers were also vulnerable oh to cache poisoning. Oh my gosh, dude. So he's going through, he's farming, he's submitting a bunch of reports, he's getting three, 4,000, you know, Per report, he's got like 20, 30 Holy of these moly. reports. Holy moly, look at this. And then he's like, he's looking through his call, his callbacks and he's like, huh, that, what is this like weird auth callback? And he realizes that there's this like NTLM auth over HTTP thing that exists yeah. for like Office 365 and a bunch of other things. And uh, as it turns out, you can also use that to steal NTLM hashes. So he was able to, through the Akamai Edge into big I F5 Big IP, poison the NTLM cache to get NTLM tokens back and, you know, full auth takeover, you know, full arbitrary redirects through cache poisoning. Um, 
Oh my I mean, gosh, yeah. I'm looking yeah, at this at the end here. Insane. They just got like absolutely a bunch insane. of uh, NTLM hashes just pouring in the, via by responder. He he's using yeah. to catch him. It looks like. Wow. Yeah, I wonder. Exactly. I wonder why. Oh, this is interesting here. So what? Why were they reaching out to Auth in the first place? Something super weird is going on here with Microsoft stuff. Yeah, I have a feeling it's because of the like weird redirect stuff that he was testing out, where he realized that he would because he could cache poison, he could basically ar arbitrarily redirect people from whatever to wherever. So bank SSO or uh, you know customer logins or what, like an anything you could put them anywhere. And so I think he was just redirecting a bunch of stuff and started to notice uh, that you know that he was getting these wow. uh, these Microsoft uh logins dude re request smuggling is such a crazy vulnerability because you just start seeing <laughs> traffic from other people's like sessions and stuff like that and yeah i i hadn't even thought about um sort of uh putting that together with like any sort of ntlm based auth because yeah there, there are mechanisms for that in, in microsoft environment that is really yeah. cool man what a yeah. what a cool and it really depends on the org and, and you know how they set it up right. but yeah i mean this was such a such a cool and I, I liked how he was able to scale it you know like that i find that's kind of challenging mm. uh, for me like when i find mm. something i usually rely on somebody else to help scale it but being able to sort of like identify that this is a widespread issue and scale it yourself is uh, is pretty awesome yeah, dude, that's sick. I'm definitely going to go back and, and read through this one a little bit more. I feel like HTTP request bundling is like one of those things that there are a couple people that are really good at it and and that like it shows up almost every live hacking event still too. You know, somebody yeah. gets like some massive crit from HTTP request smuggling and it's not like the normal the normal like big crit players normally. Uh, it's like these people that are, are really good specifically at request modeling. So I think that's one of the things that I need to sit down and sort of deep dive over the next, I don't know, a couple months and try to try to understand that a little bit better. I found it a couple times, but mostly just relying on burp and its scanner to tell me when, Hey, there might be something funky going on here. Yeah. Same. I, I feel like it's one of those things I've exploited maybe like a handful of mm -hmm. times, but I'd like to get a lot better at it. Yeah. Alrighty. Let's, uh, let's jump to, to number I guess so. That was number eight. All right, Joel. Yeah, sorry. Thanks, thanks for that, Joel. Now I'm sorry. gonna I'm gonna have to go ahead and uh, I'm gonna have to go in here and we'll go back into order what it a little was, bit. Strike. Okay, I'm gonna talk. Three. You strike through number eight and number one on our list so okay. that I I know which ones we've actually done. Um, and I'll jump down. So, like we mentioned, we're skipping number two, .NET deserialization, because it's it's very long, and we didn't have time to prep it. <laughs> um, and we're going to jump right to SMTP smuggling. Okay. And I thought this write up was was very funny. Uh, it's number three in in top web hacking techniques of 2023. And and there's a, a quote from this. Uh, uh, write-up that says, literally, quote, since this blog post is about SMT smuggling and doesn't have anything to do with web applications, da 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 da, -da. And I'm like, why is this in the 2023 top web hacking techniques if it doesn't even have anything to do with web applications? Which is true, it doesn't. Um, so the, the rest of the write-up proceeded to explain a bunch of uh, SMTP um, security mechanisms, and it does a really good job of... Uh, like starting from zero, um, because a lot of people that are reading this, or at least for me as web hacker, aren't familiar with the SMTP protocol super in depth. So they give a nice summary of uh, SPF, which is um, essentially in place to validate what IP addresses and domains are allowed to send mail for a certain domain. They they talk about DKIM. Um, which is uh, providing a signature for the body so it isn't tampered, also validated over TXT record um, by DNS. And then also DMARC. And DMARC is the one that's really doing a lot of the heavy lifting here because um, SMTP uh, protocol has two sort of from fields, right? There's the mail from field, which is sort of a part of the SMTP metadata or the, the commands that are being sent to the SMTP server when data is being transmitted. And then there's like the message data from field, which is like a different from field. So uh, often mm -hmm. something that, that a technique that's used to spoof is having the mail from being different from the actual message data from. Um, and mm -hmm. DMARC sort of solves that issue by comparing SPF, D DKIM, and the from um, in the, the actual body of the message um, to ensure alignment and that sort of thing. Um, and, and this technique, so it's called SMTP smuggling. And the reason for that is the guy sort of took inspiration from James Kettle's 
uh, HTTP smuggling research and said, hey, how can I apply some of these things to SMTP? And the, the sort of data end indicator in SMTP is uh, normally slash r slash n dot slash r slash n, right? So he's mm -hmm. like, okay, I wonder what we can do to kind of work around that. Um, and so eventually what he ends up doing is finding that some servers will accept slash n dot slash n mm -hmm. um, or slash r dot slash r um, as the terminator for a specific message, right? Um, a piece of message data. And he can use that difference along with some, um, I guess, binary data encoding stuff on some servers um, to essentially create a mismatch between the relaying SMTP server, um, the, the one that's sending the message, the one that the SPF record points to, and mm -hmm. the S SMTP server that receives the message. Um, and because you know all, all of this authentication is happening uh, on the other side of this, um, it, you know, you're you're essentially taking advantage of a mismatch between the relaying server, which is allowed to send mail for like something like Outlook.com, right? Some some big right. um, uh, domain. Uh, you, you know, that input is trusted. Um, so I, when, when I was looking at it, it kind of reminded me of a of sort of a mix of SSRF because it's taking advantage of what that server's authority is, right? And that server's yeah. position as a trusted entity to send mail um, and HTTP request smuggling um, to send mail from pretty much any domain, uh, which is which was totally badass, but not necessarily related to web hacking. <laughs> in, yeah, in not, the most not quite way. web hacking. Right. But, that, I mean, now I'm thinking like, you know, here we are linking ntlm hashes over http yeah. so yeah that's true or, you know maybe maybe it is possible somehow in some way uh maybe there's some some proxy mm. server that will allow you to send to smtp or something yeah so so, so sort of big takeaways for this one it, it, kind of understanding and applying http smuggling methodology where does the data part of the transmission stop and how can i get a mismatch between two different entities on that um that's yeah. one big thing um, and I also just really like the the um, concept of applying HTTP vulnerabilities to different protocols that might have similar functionality. Um, so I'm sure that there's other protocols out there that could benefit from HTTP smuggling-esque uh, sort of vulnerabilities. Uh, and I, I think we could definitely see some cool research coming out like that in the future. Yeah, you know, it, it makes me think, especially like how, what this looks like uh, on like code analysis side, because that's I feel like that's one aspect that I haven't really seen covered. It, like a lot of this seems to be very very black box approach. Like almost like there's some weird magic that goes on when I send all these requests in a certain way, and it just kind of works this way. Mm -hmm. But I'm more curious, like why like why does it work that like yeah. where you know, and is this like a pattern? Because to some extent, you know, this this sort of behavior is a pattern where you can. You know, basically, like trigger it. I mean, we've seen it as well. Like, uh, I don't. We can sort of tangentially talk about this, right? But like the bug that we found um, uh, in LA, uh, okay. which you know uses like line termination oh, yeah. stuff, yeah. or like you know how, how it's basically parsing like where the end of things happen. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and 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 that sort of you know weirdness with and the inconsistencies between like one one way of parsing it and another way of parsing it. So. I'm really, really curious how this kind of stuff like looks from source code, and if there's some way that we could maybe scan for that. For sure, it, it's just kind of crazy to me as well that you know all these protocols have to be able to convey arbitrary data, right? Like I need to be able to send an email to you saying, "Hey, SMTP ends with you know <laughs> uh, new line dot new line, right?" And then that that yeah. new line dot new line has to be included in the SMTP message that's sent, but also is the terminator. You know, and so th there's sort of like that data in inception of source that of sorts that happens, um, and when when delimiters like that are used, I think there's there's room for for problems. I, I have a zero day in an, a um, uh, CSS via JS uh, library right now that essentially dynamically creates CSS rules and inserts them into the DOM, um, and when it does that, it it breaks on a specific character or character sequence. And if you take that character sequence and you stick it in a um, uh, content attribute in inside CSS, uh, which allows for strings, right, by, by nature, 
uh, then it will split on that instead and allow you to get arbitrary CSS injection um, and, and will even allow for you to do like, um, what is it, Cyc cyclical import chaining where you can import other CSS um, style sheets from a, a different server. Um, and and th that uses the same thing as like, there's some delimiter, can we inject that delimiter or can we right. find some other similar delimiter that some parsers will recognize as the delimiter itself? Right. Any sort of normalization, anything like that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Super cool. You know, that's a super, super cool th This part. is one of the things that, that's really nice about doing a podcast, Joel, is like, you know, we often have to look at all this stuff and think, what 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 sort of high level principles what kind of overarching things can we draw out from this research and apply to other areas when we're talking about it on the pod um and i think just having the ability to or having to develop the ability by reading it over and over and over again to talk about it and then pull out those principles is definitely making me a better hacker every day i i can i can feel it yeah yeah i mean same dude it, it's I mean, because it requires some level of stepping back. Mm. I mean, we could have gone through and read these line by line, but it wouldn't, you know, then the reader or listener has to do the, what yeah. we're doing there. And so, exactly. um, you know, it, it, it's nice to sort of get the, those brain juices flowing and make, make, you're making me think, you know, on a Monday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it, it, it definitely is. It definitely is tricky. And you, you know, you, you know what they say, they can't, if you can't teach it, you probably don't understand it thoroughly. So. Hopefully yes, we sir, can. Yes, hopefully we can understand all this stuff thoroughly. <laughs> all right. Well, on that note, let me try and thoroughly oh explain this. This one is uh, such this... a beast, too. Oh my gosh. Oof. Good luck, okay, Joel. Yeah I, yeah, I don't. I don't know if I uh, fully understand this one. To be honest, we should have. It's, it's... We should have taken bets in advance. Like, all right, <laughs> how many out of how many? So we each have five, right? How many out of five are we going to be able to successfully get a passing grade on? Like, but... yeah, no kidding. Uh, All right. Okay. So, so this one was really, really cool. This one, what was it titled? It was titled PHP filter chains file read from error based Oracle. Mm. Okay. Um, so to start with an error based Oracle is essentially, uh, you know, similar to a SQL injection mm. where, you know, an error based injection, basically you're triggering some sort of error and using that as a way to identify that something is happening or not happening. Mm. So there's this concept in PHP where, where there's the PHP protocol, like PHP colon slash slash, and then there's all these different attributes that you can put after it. And one of them is filter. And you can actually chain these things together. So there's all these different filters that are built in to PHP uh, that you can combine um, in sequence to do all sorts of really, really interesting things. You know, there's um, ROT13 for like shifting characters, there's UTF-8 encoding, Unicode encoding, um, and the encodings are really a big part of this. You can do mm -hmm. Base64, a bit encode, decode, uh, tons and tons of things. Now there's a, Q, uh, a few key uh, different like filter attributes basically that this uh, this researcher used um, and it mainly relies on this uh, UCS4 encoding now when you do this UCS4 encoding it basically pads out each byte into multiple bytes because there's more bytes needed for each encoding of every single character and by doing that over and over and over again you can essentially grow the input to such a large output that it creates a memory overflow and throws an error all right, so there's our error. No oracle. way. You're kidding yeah, me, so, man. So, so that's what is at the end of the chain, right? And then the goal is, how do I make this thing e exit early in a predictable way so that if it exits early, I know it's one thing. If it throws an error, I know it's another thing. And that is the oracle itself. So you you can use this filter <laughs> dechunk, which is really designed to parse chunks of, you know, chunk, chunk encoded data, sure. like CRLF, uh, you know, ended data and the first character is intended to be the length of that chunk and so it will parse it as a, a hex character and so if the first character is a hex then it says okay that's the length and then it looks for a crlf after it <laughs> if it doesn't find a crlf it bails out so it doesn't throw an error <laughs> so no way, now you know dude. whether or not it's a hex character but you don't know which hex character so then there's another encoding that you can do this uh this ibm uh, 930 or, or it's CP 930 uh, encoding and every time you encode it the way that this encoding works is that it, it it actually shifts the alphabet over by like one so like an A would be hex 61 
but in this encoding, it's actually hex 62. Uh, and so it, they, it, you can do this over and over again. So say you shift it one time and nothing happens. Then you shift it two times, nothing happens. Shift it three times, nothing happens. Shift it four times, it crashes. Well, now you know what the shift is so that you can go backwards and you can figure out what each character is. And then you can do stuff like rot 13 to uh, rotate them, to get them into a known range, or you can do uh, the bite order mark encoding so that it goes backwards instead of forwards. So you can read from the end instead of the beginning. I mean, it's such a, such a cool attack. Um, And you can, as I said, you can chain these things together. So you, he has uh, this code that basically generates this massive long chain of all these different PHP filters in order that do all sorts of different shifting and byte offsetting and coding and decoding and all this stuff to leak one character at a time, uh, and, uh, an arbitrary file. And there's so much impact. Um, there's a ton of different uh, PHP attribute uh, attributes that are affected by this. Um, you can use it for uh, a ton of different functions, f gets, f gets c, f open, uh, oh parse gosh. ini file, hash file, um, PHP standard in, PHP standard out, PHP memory. Uh, I, it's, it's really, really interesting. And it's one of those things, um, they highlighted a little bit in the research, but like these, many of these filters are exist but are not well documented on how they work um like the dechunk filter which is used to parse these these uh these content transfer encoding chunks it's like written in c and it's like in the source code but there's not really very good clear documentation on how this stuff actually works so it's just such a really really cool um use of the technology and I, i one really fun thing is that at the very beginning of this blog post it's, it says, this attack method was first disclosed during the down under CTF 2020. Oh so this God. all came from a CTF. <laughs> and of course it did. I don't think anybody actually solved it. Um, <laughs> yeah, nobody solved it. No way, really? Um, oh, wow. Yeah, but basically the whole challenge was just a file call on a post parameter. So you, you can provide it an arbitrary input and it gets fed into the file function in PHP. That's it. It doesn't echo it. It doesn't do anything. It just calls it. Directly. And, Using this, right, as an error-based oracle, you could character by character have read through the whole file. No way, dude. That is yeah. like so I, I just want to I just want to specify, Joel. I, I told you before this episode that I had read this. I did not read this. This was something very <laughs> different from what I read. So Synactive, the people that did this, um, that wrote this up also did another article called PHP filter chains and what it is or what it is and how to yes. use it. Okay. Yeah, that was the precursor to this one. Yeah, it was. And my mind was already blown at the precursor. And essentially what the precursor does is gives you a script essentially to generate arbitrary content for like essentially include based stuff, right? So if you if you needed to, you no longer need to actually, if you have a PHP include, you don't need a file upload anymore to get RCE from an LFI. Um, yeah. You can just use this file or this uh, PHP scheme with all these different filters to generate arbitrary data, which then gets you know read and generates PHP functions, which is nuts. Um, it's so cool. And I thought it's that so was cool. crazy. <laughs> and now they've got this other thing where they're like literally doing 16 different ways of leaking data like by the byte, uh, which is absolutely nuts man so this is this is so cool to see but i don't know man i mean i'm sure this has real world application where people will use this to actually leak files but like this is just the most ctf thing i've ever seen in my life so uh, i i love it it's it's almost like the balance between like a ctf and code golf where yeah yeah like it seems so simple and you're like okay something there's got to be some weird functionality here and uh I, I I love thinking about problem problems in that way, even if it's not a CTF problem, because it really makes you think creatively about like, okay, let's imagine this is vulnerable. How, how you know what what are the mechanisms? What is what's every single lever I can pull, and let me go through every single one and and figure out what I can exploit. Yeah, and I'm I'm looking right now at this exploitation video. I just kind of got like nerd type of it. and it's fast too. It's not, it's not particularly slow. You know, I thought it'd it's, be it's like, really you know, try like 160 requests or whatever for one, you know, bite, but it's, it's pretty fast too, which is very impressive. Um, 
wow, what a piece of research, yes, man! Dude, you got so cool. many of the, you got so many cool ones. Now I gotta, well, I'm sure they're all cool. You know, I, I gotta go and read them all. Um, but that that one's definitely, I'm gonna go back and reread that one. Um, although I probably should probably go back and reread it next time I've got an L five because I'm definitely not gonna remember <laughs> yeah. any of that shit the next well, time now that I'm I, thinking about yeah. uh, WordPress folds especially yeah. and. Um, and the impact there. I've had an LFI on WordPress stuff in the past, um, you yeah. know, year for sure. Um, actually in the past three months, but I think actually something interesting is going on with PHP eight. I believe PHP eight doesn't allow you to do the PHP scheme anymore for Ooh. like a certain number of calls. Like I want to say like F stat based calls, I think. So like file exists and that sort of thing, um, or stat based calls. Um, so that's something to look up as well. All right, man. Number four on the list done. We're making progress. We're pushing through. Um, next one on the list is HTTP parser inconsistencies. And I actually super loved this research. I've tweeted about this research before um, You know, it got put on the list here. But uh, this is such a, a great example of just like really quality, <laughs> high quality, Lee conducted research. What, what am I trying to say? Uh, the quality of this research is very high in the way that they've conducted it. Um, and there's a, a bunch of different um, backends that essentially they've compared with how Nginx in particular uh, parses routes. And they provided vulnerable configurations specifically based off of the trim or strip functionality associated with these languages. So essentially, what kind of characters, like a new line character, like you know, white space characters, uh, non-displayed characters, that sort of thing, can you append at the end or at some spot in a route that will make it um, uh, not match a... a Nginx rule or match an Nginx rule and still match a route on the on the backside. So let's say you've got sort of like a a, a blacklist on the front end for um, you know Nginx and you you want to access an admin route on the back end. So th that's the whole scenario they set up here. They set up like just like a slash admin route or whatever that just says admin and it says they've got an Nginx route on the front end that just says deny admin um, and then they get access to that by adding um, these various characters. So I'll just kind of read through these really quickly um, to give you guys an idea for the various languages. Um, and hopefully you'll go and document these yourself so that you, you know, when you see the various server headers uh, pertaining to these various technologies, you'll understand uh, what kind of inconsistencies could be in place with Nginx in those backends. So um, first up was, uh, was Node.js. And there is a bypass. There are many bypasses for Node.js when it comes to Nginx. Um, reverse proxy sort of, uh, um, I guess, blocking or uh, blocking a specific route. Um, the, the one that works in the most versions is the backslash X A O uh, character. Um, so that, that code point. Uh, and that works in versions 1.16 through 1.22. Um, and, but there's also other ones such as the uh, hex 09 and OC characters that get stripped out by um, nodes trim function and does they don't get stripped out by Nginx on the front end. So Nginx assumes it's a different route, whereas node understands that it's that once it's trimmed, this is actually just the slash admin route. Yeah, and I just I'll mm -hmm. interrupt for a second. Sure. I just love this aspect of hacking where it's like so often when you're testing these types of things, you're putting like dot dot slashes or percent zero a or backslash n, or, but you're not actually trying the character itself. And this is this is like the the cool step where it's like an actual you know like mm -hmm. x a zero yeah like the you know this weird hidden like non printable character that mm. is getting sent through and parsed weirdly yeah. No, it, it, it is really good stuff. And there, it, it's odd to me, and I haven't taken the time to dive deep and understand why each one of these specific characters is a part of 
the various languages, um, you know, trim or strip uh, functionalities. Uh, but it's kind of odd that this is so hard. Like, why can't we just say, okay, white space is a space and a tab and a new line, you know? And, and the answer to that yeah. is because there's so much variance in the specs and, and, and stuff like that. But um, it's just something that seems like it shouldn't be that hard, but is actually very hard. And that margin is where we live, Joel. That margin is, <laughs> exactly. uh, is where we, we make we our money. in the margins. <laughs> exactly. So uh, cool takeaways for this one. You know, make sure you're trying all of these uh, sort of hexadecimal code points, which obviously correlate to various ASCII characters. Um, I guess maybe not be within the ASCII range. Uh, but these are all very cool to, to try out. And essentially what we need to be able to do is identify, hey, there's Nginx plus some backend where the incompatibility is there. Um, so the, the ones that they've talked about here are Node, specific Node versions, Flask, Spring Boot, um, PHP, uh, and I think that was it. And they also talked about some stuff with um, with AWS uh, WAF in particular, which was super weird, okay? Uh, so I'll, I'll deviate from that whole um, strip and trim uh, functionality there to bypass uh, various Nginx uh, block blocking rules and actually talk about this this other sort of like extra that they kind of threw into this write up, which is essentially like apparently some backends parse line folding in headers as a thing. So essentially, you have an HTTP header, right? So x colon blah 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 slash r slash n, right? And then if the next line starts with a tab character then it assumes that, that that is a continuation of the previous line and is, hmm. is actually a part of the uh, character that's above it. So in the write-up, they actually found a way to bypass uh, the um, uh, Amazon WAF uh, using this. Uh, but I just thought that was a weird thing to actually have some languages parse. Like, why are we line wrapping HTTP headers at the protocol level? <laughs> like, what is going on here? It's so weird. It's so weird. And, um, you know, I will say it sort of has an overall arching theme mm. across these top 10. I, I don't recall if it was pulled out as sort of a conclusion within the article itself. But what I've noticed a lot is it's a lot of like parsing bugs lately where yeah. these are like these aren't anything like it's not like we're even talking about new protocols mm. or anything. Right. We're talking about HTTP. We're talking about, um, you know, SMTP, sure. Again, old protocol, but it's not like protobuf or or, yeah. or some new technology or anything that's causing this. These are all like existing proto or existing protocols and technologies that are very widely used, but just have some fundamental issues depending on the implementation. Um, and a lot of it also reminds me of the orange research that we talked about um, not too long ago mm. about the, legendary stuff. Know, H yeah. The HTTP parser stuff and the NGINX, um, you know, parser bugs with semicolons and dot, dot slashes and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. There's, there's, there's always going to be those sort of bugs. And it kind of goes back to what we were talking about last week, which is like context, understanding the context is king in, in all of these scenarios, yeah. really, because almost all of web vulnerabilities uh, I'm sure there's cut and dry access controls and stuff like that, but almost all web vulnerabilities originate from some sort of misunderstanding or um, misconstruing of context and what yeah. data is to be interpreted in what context. Um, yeah. Or assumptions. Yeah, or assumptions on that, exactly. Um, yeah. and, and so let me see. I think I thought there was one more little takeaway from this one that I wanted to mention. Oh, yeah, the other cool thing that they kind of mentioned within this research as well was various backends have a different way of parsing um, the... So, you know, when you do an HTTP request, it's like get or post or whatever, and then the space, and then normally slash, and then it provides the path, right? Mm -hmm. um, some backends parse that path piece differently when the first character is not a a slash, so some people huh. will allow, or some some people <laughs> some backends will allow you to put an at sign there, which is super helpful for SSRF in some scenarios. Um, some will allow you to put a, a semicolon there. Some will allow you to put a and that's often in the um, in sort of like the Spring um, environments where matrix parameters are a thing. Um, and then some uh, I want to say the 
was it PHP environment? For some reason, we'll just let you put a an asterisk there, uh, which hmm. is real weird. Like I don't even know, they didn't even mention in there why they let you put an asterisk there. But it, this well, is this something to fuzz for sure. But another thing that I've mm. seen is uh, you can put full HTTP URLs yeah. there as well. Mm. Um, that's for proxy syntax, I think, by default. HTTP, um, but uh, zero point nine, I think, s- syntax. Yeah, yeah. Some, yeah, something like that. But it also w- will work in like you know other HTTP versions. So it, it all depends on the implementation and and what they choose to support. It's super super weird. Backwards compatibility, another thing yep. that uh, makes us our living. <laughs> 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 all right, um, that's all I had for this one. Uh, you want to go ahead and take the next one, or or maybe we can tag team that one since we uh, we didn't get fully through that one. Yeah. So this one this one was from a, 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 a Kaspersky researcher, mm. Sergey Bobrov. Um, he's a he's a really talented um, researcher, mm. and he gave this presentation at uh, Off uh, Off Zone twenty twenty three. Mm. Um, and it's basically talking about these HTTP requests uh, splitting vulnerabilities and it, it all stems from these uh, Nginx misconfigurations, right? Uh, just like Orange Research, just like, um, you know, many other pieces of research, it's very easy to misconfigure things uh, without realizing it's a misconfiguration. Simply just by like trying to use, you know, oh, I'm going to write this config out you and you put uh, an extra character or something or you mm. copy paste it and you didn't really know what it did so you, you make, just left it you in to make be safe. ChatGPT write it <laughs> <laughs> yeah exactly and it's like here you go this this will work in all cases um and, and so it's it's super super interesting there's um you know the root of it is basically uh this uh this regex right that's looking for uh a slash uh mm. instead of just allowing all characters to go through so so yeah um, the, uh, I, I brought a, broke a couple things out here into the doc, Joel, for this one. And, and that regex piece, I think, requires a little bit uh, nuance here. So essentially, what, what's crazy with this is, is maybe, maybe we'll, we'll put this up on the screen for those of you that are on YouTube. Uh, put on screen, please. Put that one up. Um, but essentially, there's, there's this regex when you're defining a location in Nginx reverse proxy configurations. And if you use, it, when I looked at this, it's just so weird. So if you use dot star, then that's the safe configuration, you know, for this, because yeah. it's not going to allow you to inject. <laughs> it, it feels so backwards. It, it does. It, it's not going to let you inject, like, um, apparently these line break characters that are going to make everything terrible. But if you use an, a, a um, I guess, an exclusive range, so if you say, a square bracket and then the car- upward right. caret slash and then close close brackets. You're saying yeah. okay, allow every single character except for the slash. And in that scenario, uh, uh, that's a more permissive definition actually than the dot character, which is super yeah. weird and will allow you to inject new line characters and line breaks, which will allow you to just overwrite the whole request, which is nuts to me. It's super interesting because I, I want to say that. I can't remember if in if in regex by default the dot it's supposed to include white space, but I don't know if it includes new lines. That's interesting. Unless you explicitly have the uh, like multi line yeah. flag on, right? That's a good point. Yeah, that could be what it but was. There's probably some weird implementation issue here because, like you said, one is like an exclude, like an mm. exclusive range where it's like any character that's not a slash versus any character that's a dot mm. which then gets translated into a through z like any character ex- maybe except new lines mm. um or, or whatever so it's just like it's it's such a weird new one like it i is. mean i would have never expected that and, and, those two things would be backwards and, and just to be clear here what we're talking about is is matching the location on an nginx reverse proxy rule so this is right. the definition for what route you can hit and it will trigger a certain block of code um, and inside of that there's regex to allow for things like ids and that sort of things to be included um, so this is this is really uh, some some cool research and it makes me wish that i had the nginx configuration files for so many of these targets that i work on that use nginx so it's like man i'm sure there's so many like weird edge cases out there that um, that this could could cause, and yeah. um, and and the next one as well is is a proxy pass based um, uh, nginx problem, which was actually 
originating from some some research Franz did, of course, you know, years before everyone else started thinking about it <laughs> in true blue Franz style, um, which most of you guys have seen likely where he was proxy uh, doing a proxy pass to uh, Amazon AWS and was able to override the host header. And since the, the host is actually... Um, you know, since the backend server is the same for all S3 buckets there, he could actually specify his own bucket as the host header. It would get virtual routed to his bucket and he was allowed to host any arbitrary content on a website. Um, so that those are the two sort of main techniques that they mentioned in there for like how this vulnerability could occur. And the other thing that I thought was cool here, Joel, was the detection methods for this that they sort of outlined. Because... Yeah. Um, I think this sort of bug is a little bit tricky to understand and a little bit tricky to find um, without source code because you're not able to look at the configuration file and say like, hey, oh, that's one of those like commonly known patterns that could result in HTTP request uh, splitting. Um, and so they mentioned a couple detection methods that could be helpful for this. And the first one is simply visiting you know, site.com slash and then the path to whatever your um, anticipated split um, what am I trying to say there, Joel? The 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 place where you believe the split may be occurring, right? Where the, right, right. The intended delimiter. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and then actually just putting a space and an X there. So the actual backend HTTP request that gets generated is get or whatever slash the path space X space HTTP slash 1.1 or whatever, right? And yep. that will result in a 400 on the backend. And hopefully that will bounce forward through the reverse proxy and show you a 400. Um, the, uh, I'm sorry, that, that will give you a different error code. <laughs> that, that's the differentiator. That has to give you a different error code. So if you put the space X in there, it needs to give you some error code that's not a 400. Then right. if instead you put space H, Nginx by default, it looks at that and says, oh, that starts with an H. That's them specifying the HTTP protocol. That's so funny. Right? So that's them saying, that's the beginning of HTTP slash 1.1, right? Um, and then it will say, hey, we're parsing, the, we're parsing the, the protocol here now. Oh, H is the protocol? That's weird. That's not a valid protocol. Bam, 400, right? So this is a, this is a good way to tell whether you're actually injecting into this sort of backend. Um, you're injecting into the actual syntax of the HTTP request because you Space X should give you some other error code, and Space H, because of that Nginx sort of tendency, should give you a 400. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the the you, one step further, right, mm -hmm. where Space HTTP, and then you give it a you know a, a bad version like 13.37, uh, and you finish the uh, CRLF at the end, mm -hmm. and it should say you know bad protocol or something. Exactly. And, that's for sure, for sure, then you're, you've got zero alpha injection. Yeah, so, so the input there would be space HTTP slash 13.37, of course. And then the new line character, so we're completing that first line of the HTTP request, right? And then we'll you know add like the, an X header or something like that to catch the remainder of the original HTTP request. And then when yeah. the reverse proxy tries to uh, communicate with the backend server like that, the backend server is like, wait, what the heck? I can't use HTTP. 13.37, I don't know that protocol, kicks back a 505. And 505 is a very rare error code. I've only, I don't think I've ever seen I've, it actually. Yeah, I've never yeah. seen it. Yeah. Um, and so um, if you're able to trigger a 505, then you've certainly got request splitting. So this could be great for any of you people out there that are doing mass scanning and want mm -hmm. some high signal um, like scans to do for, for HTTP request smuggling. Just what yeah. I would do is actually, you know, run GAO or something like that. Take all of the paths that come out of GAO, and then at that sort of junction, at that each path level, then put this this payload in there, and then look for detect off of 505s, and you should have a pretty high signal response for anything that that could be vulnerable to HTTP request smuggling. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Super, super interesting. So I love those little detection methods, yeah. you know, those easy takeaways. And then if you see something that's working, go back to that paper and then start to read a little bit deeper and, and see how to exploit it. Exactly, man. Oh, man, the next one is so good. Kinugawa Masato-san, thank you so much for this for this write-up. Um, I feel like nobody better could have could have gotten the, the summary for this one. So <laughs> I'll, I'll let you go ahead. No, it's it's great, and uh, I. I 
So actually at the beginning of, of so number seven, well, let me, before I get ahead of myself, let me talk about this, what this actually is. Number seven is how I hacked Microsoft Teams and got 150K in Pwn to Own by uh, Masato Kinugawa. Um, and essentially this write-up was great. And in the beginning of it, he's like, hey, you know, if you're interested about the non-technical experience that I had with Pwn to Own, here's a couple podcasts in Japanese for you. So I've got those on my list. I'm gonna like put it on like 0.75 speed and try to keep up with these guys in in Japanese. But um it, I was able to fully parse through the um amazing write-up that he did. And wow, there are some great takeaways from this one. Um, so essentially what's happening here is they're in an electron environment uh, hacking Microsoft Teams for Pwn to Own. And uh, essentially he gives us some cool takeaways on what to look for in an electron environment. Pretty basic stuff, stuff I've heard before, but still helpful to review. So um, whenever the browser window object is instantiated in, a, a, um, in an electron environment, um, there will be some parameters that can be passed into this. Three parameters of interest in particular. Node integration, context isolation, and sandbox, okay? And so what this is gonna do, take those one by one. Node, node integration. If node integration is set to true, then if you get XSS on this target, um, this is the traditional thing you kind of always hear about when you when you get XSS in an in a Electron application, then you should just be able to get RC. Well, that's only true if Node in integration is set to true, because then in that case you could access the Node Node.js APIs directly and do something like require and just run you know whatever code and exec your your calculator or whatever. But if this is set to false, then you don't have access to um, the Node API and you're not going to be able to. Um, get <laughs> RC as easily. Unfortunately for uh, uh, Masato, then th in the scenario, this was actually set to false, so he had to figure out some other way to get RC, even if he had XSS. Um, the second one is, uh, this is the second parameter that you should be looking in, into in sort of the instantiation of the browser window object, which is core to the Electron applications, um, is the context isolation sort of argument or boolean here. If, if this is set to false, then the context between um, the client-side JS and the JS that has access to node APIs um, is not actually segmented. Um, and, and because of that, what you can do is do prototype pollution. And that's what he ended up doing later on in this, in this um, write-up, is he overwrites the function.call <laughs> um, uh, definition prototype and was able to snag access to... Pretty good one to it, overwrite. It, it's baller, <laughs> I'm not going to lie. Um, and was able to detect when the correct function was being passed in and get access to some stuff that he needed, um, which is really cool. And the last one is sandbox false or true. Um, that one is pretty clear for anyone who has ever worked with Chrome. That's whether Chrome's going to be running in a sandbox. Um, if this is set to false, then you've got a much easier time exploiting Chrome-related bugs um, inside of an Electron application. If it's set to true, then you've got to figure out how to escape the sandbox, even if you get like a Chrome-based RCE. Um, so, so cool. So th there's that. But dude, this isn't even the craziest part, Joel. This, this is crazy, oh, man. Okay. Th so I, I mean, here I was saying, no, 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 thinking it's it was stuff, crazy. I'm not even there yet. Thank you for the information. Um, but you've got to see the way he gets XSS on this thing, man. So, you know, he's, he's participating in Pwn to Own. Yeah. Pwn to Own is a no user interaction event. So you've got to pwn them without anyone interacting with it, essentially. Yep. And essentially what he found was that he could send a message to a user over Microsoft Teams and um, he could specify some, you know, basic markdown tags, right? Like bolding and stuff like yep. that. And when you look at how that's implemented, you're able to implement a couple, you know, HTML tags that are helpful. And he, he found a, a, uh, a whitelist for uh, class names that can be specified on these, uh, you know, like the strong tag or whatever, right? So now he's That's got so like, crazy. okay, I can specify some, and one of those those whitelists had a, a star with it. So it was like Swift dash whatever, right? So now he can specify any class name that starts with Swift dash, which is like, how could this possibly be helpful, right? Like, and I just, I don't understand how. And Joel, using that, using not even arbitrary class name injection, he gets XSS, which is just absolutely, so absolutely inspiring. Um, 
and it, and it's really um, a great reason to look deep and understand how this application, you know, how, how these applications are working in every single bit of every single inch you can take from the application might be able to be used in an exploit. That's so awesome. I mean, it, it's gotta be like the perfect stars aligning feeling where like he's looking through, he's like, Oh no way. Like, Oh, yeah. so, so this exists. Epic. Exactly. So this is how he did it, Joel. Angular is being used in this uh, application, right? On the front end. And, Yep. There, if you could specify an arbitrary attribute in Angular, you could specify the uh, ng init attribute, which would allow you to run some code. Pretty standard stuff with Angular, um, uh, if you're familiar with it at all. However, what I do not know is that the ng init attribute can also be specified by a class attribute, which is super weird. Look, look at the look at the screenshot oh. in the doc, dude. Uh, yeah, look what yeah. he's got here. He says any element ng init equals expression, right? That's what one we're familiar with. Any element class equals ng dash init uh, colon dude. expression also yeah. allows you to just run arbitrary JS code inside of the class attribute for any freaking HTML tag. That's so weird. What? Like it make, like why? Like, why does that work? I don't know, but it's makes no sense. It's more contexts in which you can get XSS, which is really cool. Um, so then he's able to use, you know, constructor.constructor .constructor or whatever, the, the, one of the classic um, ways to call arbitrary JS code um, and uh, get XSS. So now he's got XSS from when, it, a, a, from, you know, just sending a user a message and, that now he's going to use the context isolation to get RC via that, which was an absolutely crazy part of this write up and not particularly generally applicable to yeah. most environments. So I won't go too deep into it, but essentially what he does is gets access to this object um, called IPC renderer. And this is uh, inter-process communication renderer. And this allows you to communicate between the main process in, in, um, in an electron application, which is a little bit more privileged, and the renderer pro uh, process. Um, and essentially, using that inter-process communication renderer object, he's able to communicate with a listener on that side uh, that's loaded up that has a vulnerability in it and is able to pop RCE um, and land that sweet, sweet pwn to own money. Um, but Biggest takeaways for me on this one, make sure an Electron application, you're checking those three attributes, node integration, context isolation, sandbox, and then also, what the heck, apparently you can get XSS via class name injection. Who knew? Yeah. I mean, that is like the last thing I would have ever tried uh, of all things. Like, maybe if I was just broadly <laughs> scanning for payloads and every attribute available on a, on an element maybe but like uh, that's, when that's you've so truly crazy. given up <laughs> yeah the, the the levels of desperation that we go to um to pop xss okay. man um okay so joel you already covered akamai f5 um yes which correct. was number eight number nine yep. it, I'll, I'll just kind of breeze through really quickly um and essentially, this is Cookie Crumbles. This is a long academic paper written in academic style with a bunch of like, you know, special notation where like, you know, why is this? And it's like, why, why are we making this so complicated? <laughs> um, but I read it and it was good. And uh, it had some cool, some cool techniques in it. Um, some things that weren't quite as applicable um, that they seem to be excited about, but I, I don't think had as, as much real world application. But um, I pulled the good bits out for you and I'm going to go ahead and tell you about them right now. They tried to, re nice. they tried to rename C-Surf to, to Corf, which is uh, a more accurate hmm. sort of representation of most of the um, cross-site Typical academic Request forgeries. I know. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, nothing against the people. I mean, they wrote a great piece of research, but um, that is the more specific name, cross-origin request forgery. So if you're one of those people that would like to be a little bit more specific with what they're talking about, um, uh, you know, I think you could use cross-site request forgery and cross-origin request forgery um, to, Interchangeably. to yeah. to be able to specify the various nuances of these specific situations where you may be same site but different origin 
Um, and, you know, so there's some nuances with, with regards to that regarding to same site cookies. So that's one, one little thing. A couple other things they talked about, stuff we've talked about on the pod before, cookie tossing, um, which is essentially using um, the path attribute of a specific cookie to override the value of a cookie that's already in place. Um, we've talked about this before, but I'll just provide a little refresher. Cookies that are set, so let's say you've got a cookie set gadget via an XSS or something like that. You can make your cookie prioritized in the user's browser, um, if there's a cookie of the same name, by specifying a more specific path. Um, uh, otherwise, it will default to which one was created first. Um, so really helpful thing there. It doesn't actually depend on which domain was specified in the cookie at all, which probably it should. But um, uh, you probably should go by more specific domain, but such is life. The path yeah. specificity piece is really helpful for, you know, overriding, for doing session fixation and that sort of things. Like um, when you need to get your cookie prioritized over a cookie that may already be set in the victim's browser. <sighs> take a breath. Take a breather there. Next one is cookie jar over. That's 150 pages. Yeah, what? Dude, <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I mean, how, I mean, our notes from this uh, episode as well are like what? Eight pages long. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't even know. I turned off the pages because I didn't want to. It's nuts, but. man. Um, and, and then the next thing they talk about cookie jar overflowing. We talked about that. I've got an app set up at apps.renerator.dev that you can check out to see you know how many cookies you need to overflow your specific browser. Normally, it's about 180. Um, and another cool takeaway is you can push out HTTP only cookies from the the cookie jar with non HTTP only cookies. So good to know. Hmm. Very interesting. The novel attacks from this research, there were two. Um, and these have also been mentioned by uh, Ankur Sundara, whose uh, write-up we mentioned and we'll link in the description, uh, we mentioned in the past. Um, but essentially, these attacks are surrounding nameless cookies and how you can set a cookie that doesn't have a name. And so it's set dash cookie colon equals something. And the way that browsers handle that is really, really hecked up, and servers don't know how to parse it, and everybody's like screaming, and like, it's it's bad. Um, <laughs> and so, if you think there's some sort of weird nuance you can do with that, uh, that's a functionality that you're that you should be aware of. Um, unfortunately, uh, most of the applications of this, from an attacking perspective, are overriding the underscore underscore host and underscore underscore secure prefixes to cookies, which are essentially just um, like more secure versions of the cookie attributes, um, secure and setting the domain attribute. Um, mm -hmm. So there's not a ton of, of uh, application of these nameless cookies, but it's still some nice quirk to be aware of. And um, there's lots of... Uh, sort of misconfigurations and misinterpretations of cookies um, when those cookies' names starts with an equal sign that they sort of documented yeah. in this paper. Um, and, and, and I think that they also listed a bunch of CVEs that they found and got fixed in this paper, which, cool, you know, because we, Pretty neat. you know, you may be able to bypass those or use them in an environment um, that is like, when you're dealing with that sort of older technology, but they're patched now, so not a ton of super awesome takeaways from from that, from like a, a, a sort of a methodology perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. But I do love that little uh, replacement. Like you know, it's just a, one of those gadgets you tuck in your back pocket, and, mm. and uh, later when when you need it, and that one off chance, uh, it'll be there when you need it. Exactly, exactly. All right. <laughs> The next sort of novel attack that they sort of mentioned here um, is various bypasses for underscore underscore host, like I mentioned before, in in a bunch of different server side parsing environments. PHP, we all know the thing. Well, maybe we don't all know. It's pretty well known that PHP replaces dots with underscores, um, mm -hmm. and a couple other characters I think as well, uh, dashes included, with underscores yep. in, when they're populating their. Uh, infamous dollar sign underscore get under dollar sign underscore post dollar sign underscore cookie objects. Um, so that caused some problems for essentially processing those cookies as well. Um, so be on the lookout yep. for those sort of discrepancies. Um, the last piece of helpful information from this uh, 
write up or from this research that I was able to find was a pretty well documented description of various sea surf protections. Um, they they came they, there was a couple far fetched examples where they were like you know if you're able to like set a cookie and there's like pre session fixation and like the generator for the sea surf token is linked to like the pre session not the actual session it's like there's some really odd stuff uh, in there um, that that didn't seem quite as uh, applicable um, than, you know, there, there were those, which was interesting. But the one that I thought was most helpful was they make a, a, a description of a common C-Surf framework, which I'm not sure we've actually talked about here on the pod, which is called the double submit pattern of uh, C-Surf protection, okay? And essentially okay. what this is is... The, the application will set a, a cookie on the user session that says CSERF token equals XYZ, right? And then when you yep. send a request, you have to send in the body CSERF token equals XYZ. And on the server yep. side, it will compare the cookie that you sent and the cookie in the request body and make sure that those align. And if it is, then it passes the CSERF check. Um, yep. So this, I've seen this many times. I've bypassed this many times. If there's a way for you to fixate a session, a session, a CSERF token, and get your CSERF token prioritized, right, using the path methodology that we mentioned before, you can fixate that token, you know, maybe using a subdomain, an XSS in a subdomain or something like that, and get your token prioritized, and then um, send that value as a CSERF token parameter in your post request or whatever request to CSERF. Um, and that will result in a bypass of CSERF protection. So that was something that they documented really clearly that I don't think we've talked about before. So I figured I'd, I'd mention that as well as the last piece of information uh, in this cookie crumbles academic research analysis. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Take about. laughs> that, that, that was a man. That was such a dense one. It's yeah. Uh, it, it sucks because it's such awesome research, mm. but it's uh, it's very difficult to like get through it. You know, like yeah. If only these academics could figure out how to write blogs. <laughs> I know, man. I know, and you know, I I I I hate. I hate to dislike it, to be honest, because they're doing us a great service and finding a bunch of really cool things, but. Um, yeah, it's so different reading blogs versus reading academic write-ups. So, but maybe that's my yeah, own experience absolutely. as well. You know, maybe I just need to read more academic papers. <laughs> as somebody who's written a couple academic papers, it's uh, yeah, it's definitely a little song and dance uh, to to you know for the whole process, and it could be simplified. I think sure is, man. All right, last one on the list: EPP server takeover by our boy Sam Curry. Um, let's go ahead and give a a um analysis of this one uh we'll talk about it and uh close it out for this for this episode um yeah sure you want to go ahead and, and take it it's, it's a pretty straightforward xxe i think but it's just the most crazy critical piece of I mean, <laughs> environment ever yeah right it's like <laughs> extremely extremely safe uh, straightforward so there's this whole protocol called epp mm. it runs on port 700 and it's an XML based protocol and literally like the most like open a socket on port <laughs> 700 send the like github.com <laughs> textbook example of uh, of an XCC payload and it's like full read of Etsy password you know what I, it's like <laughs> it's, re it's really really like the most simple XXE possible which is kind of terrifying uh, knowing that that is you know was running some core part of the you know, internet infrastructure for a very very long time and was just widely vulnerable uh for a very very long time uh, but it's just one of those great great examples of you know don't take anything for granted right mm. maybe that's the takeaway for this it's like even if it's a core technology even if it's something that seems really straightforward don't take that for granted it's probably vulnerable and you should you should dig a little deeper yeah right because Ab every single thing today is but you know like Fundamental HTTP, fundamental SMTP, fundamental EPP, uh, all the P's, like yeah, everything. It's uh, it's it's. I mean, it's it's mind-boggling uh, to think uh, how many things I probably have looked over, just because I'm like, ah, there's no way that's. And, and I'm not going to spend time on that. I think the other really cool thing that they did here was actually understand. They they strayed outside of the realm of web app security, and they they went into this you know, 
odd protocol that's running on, on port 700. And yeah. sometimes the dubs are there, you know? Um, yeah. and, and so that's really, that's really impressive, I think. Um, and, and, and I just, this line cracks me up, man. He said, you know, like you said, he like, it, it's the, the same, you know, leak Etsy password, uh, sort of r default XXC payload that you see from GitHub. And he says, <laughs> our proof of concept was extremely effective. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great it was dude it was it was amazing um it's so awesome and it just goes to show that that uh there are weak spots and those weak spots are going to be the best spot to get in because they got control of how many i mean this is like 20 top level domains um yeah seriously from from this and um the the other thing that i'll say here is that notice how they they pivoted right you know they, they didn't yeah. just uh, take this XXE. They used it to grab some some source code and parse out some Java that was running in there. And then they found another LFI that allowed them mm -hmm. to get access to Etsy Shadow and somebody's private key to actually <laughs> yeah. log into the server, which is so just awesome. so badass. <laughs> which had backups of all the root zones as well. <laughs> Dude, it, it's nuts too that how much of this, so awesome. how much of this internet infrastructure that we all rely on every day is like just taped together oh. with you yeah. know already owned stuff yeah yeah absolutely yeah. nuts man well on that lovely uh optimistic note <laughs> yeah on that it's a wrap right anything else we got on on this one i think that was about it we we actually moved through this pretty quickly probably because we skipped the 124 page dot net deserialization yeah. white paper yeah yeah no kidding yeah i um I mean, it's still a really, really interesting paper. There's a bunch of CVs in that one as well. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I'm i for sure going to go circle back on that one and, and read through it a little more closely, especially when I'm testing on .NET stuff. Absolutely. Um, let, yeah. let me ask you this, Joel. Let's let's reorder them, okay? We'll, we'll, we'll pull we'll pull the, uh, the .NET deserialization one out because we haven't, you know, done our, our due diligence on that one. But if we were to go ahead and reorder this, where would you put it? Hmm. Okay. I think I would put, I would leave the state machine at the top. That one's the most widely impactful, I think, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that is really cool, fundamental, like, research, in my opinion. Mm. I think I would put the HTTP request splitting, the HTTP parser inconsistency, and the... Akamai to F5, those are all very, very close to me. I think mm. I'd bundle them together somewhere together. Maybe not, maybe like third place. I think second. Third through second sixth place. place. Uh, third place. Yeah, third through sixth. Second place, hacking Microsoft Teams. Really? Uh, I think so. Because that's such, I mean, that's like <laughs> so crazy. Uh, or maybe, no, sorry. Second EPP. Oh, I'm I'm all out of order here now. Okay, first place sma <laughs> stacking, smashing the stack. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Place, wait, wait a second, wait a second. EPP. I'm gonna I'm gonna actually write down Joel's list here. Okay, so okay. smashing, <laughs> smashing the state machine. Stack the stack, the state machine. Not the uh, yeah. Yep, there you Not go. Stack. That one. Yeah, the state machine. Okay. Um, EPP number EPP. two. Numbers three through six tied or. Tied for third. Okay, uh, so we've got parser inconsistencies. Parser inconsistencies. Okay, and uh, Akamai F five. Plus splitting, Akamai F five. And then okay, hacking Microsoft Teams. Teams. Okay. Then SMTP and cookie crumbling. Filter and chains. Filter chains. Filter chains. Filter seven. chains. I'm, I'm almost. Tempted to put that a little lower, but uh, and then cookie crumbles and SMTP. SMTP. All right, dude. So you said smashing the state machine, EPP, parser inconsistencies, request splitting, Akamai to F5, teams, filter chains, cookie crumbles, SMTP, uh, smuggling. This is a very different order than what I would do. The only one okay. probably that's similar is smashing the state. Okay. Uh, so I think I'm going to put mine at smashing the state machine at the top. And the reason for that is that it's very elegant research 
the con he explains it really well. The concept's fairly simple. The implementation is very clear, and the implications are giant for an underserved vulnerability class. Um, second, for me, man, I don't know if if the filter chain piece where you can just um, generate arbitrary content, like generate like you know question mark PHP, you know run PHP info or exec or whatever. If that's included, which I think is extremely applicable research, then I gotta put I gotta put um, filter chains at at number two. Yeah, filter chains is one of those like uh, when I'm looking at my list, it doesn't feel like number seven. I think it's yeah. hard because I mean it's somewhere in like three through three through three or four. I think yeah, maybe I would put filter chains above the three parsing ones after e the EPP server. Mm. The EPP server for me is like such a cool, like fundamental, like internet core uh, infrastructure thing mm. um, that that is so, so crazy dangerous um, and like so simple that it falls in number two for me. But if it was like you needed admin perms or something, that would be higher on the list. Yeah. I'm, I'm seeing you type your list out. So number one, you've got sm st smashing the state machine. Number two, filter chains. Three, teams. Uh, four, quest splitting. Five, parser inconsistencies. Six, cookie crumbles. Seven, Akamai, which is interesting. Why do you split the Akamai out from the other uh, parser ones? So I'm kind of doing it based off of... Oh, dude, your, your, your laptop did the thing where it's like... Where it did the thumbs up thing again. Did oh, you see what? that? Okay, there, no way, because I'm not even using the external... Oh, it's on. Uh, I turned it off. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> what, what is that thing, dude? It, it pops up it every is, couple videos. It's this thing called Reactions, and it's built into Mac. I don't know... That's, I, I thought it was only when I was using my phone as an it's, external camera. It's so weird. I'm now so realizing... Essentially, what happens is he'll like do a, like a thumbs up on the screen or something like that. And then... I'm like holding the mic like this. And, it's... And, it, and it'll parse it as a thumbs up. And then it'll do like the thumbs up emoji on the screen. I'm like, so why weird. are you doing that? Um, okay, hopefully, it's now all, all for right. good. Man, now I'm going to have to check that every let single me, time. Let me, explain, let me explain my order here, okay? So smashing the state machine, obvious. Filter chains, I think there's a big amount of implement... Uh, implications to this research with turning LFI to RCE. Easy peasy. No, you just eliminated a very strong precondition, a very challenging precondition to go to RCE, um, which is awesome. Um, teams, I think the, the piece about just going from class name to injection to XSS is just stunning. Um, so I, I gave him credit for that. And then also the technical details, while we, we didn't really cover them here, of that inter-process communication um, technique that he used there uh, was, was really, really engaging. And I think um, highlights a knowledge of electron internals that uh, I hadn't really seen showcased elsewhere. So I, I think that, that that was why I placed that at, at three. Request smuggling and yeah. parser inconsistencies very practical and very reproducible in action, you know, actual environments. Reverse proxies are used everywhere. Reverse proxies are used to block off endpoints everywhere. So I think, um, uh, you know, these pieces of research are very applicable. Cookie crumbles I actually put this at six because I think that there the cookies are an underserved piece of uh, sort of browser mechanics they were very okay. much focused on you know back in the days of like csurf coming out and that sort of thing and um you know even just in like dom xss environment i feel like cookies are just kind of underserved in general um and so i i've, I've got some extra love for cookies lately um akamai i put that below to break it out um mostly because cookie crumbling didn't really seem right at seven uh, and the Akamai one is a little bit less, it's kind of, kind of like a Vuln story, less of a like applicable research that can be used in other environments. Um, and then I put the EPP stuff there as well uh, in eight, because once again, it's a Vuln story, um, which is very engaging and fascinating. And I'm so glad I heard the story, but um, not necessarily reproducible for us in other environments. And then number nine, we both put SMTP smuggling there because it's not a web vulnerability. 
Um, so I think I think that's kind of where my my top top ten or top nine, I guess, um, lands on the list. Uh, pretty different from from what they actually came up with. Yeah, I mean, it's super. I, I, reading through, I think. I think yours or your your ordering is probably a little more level headed than You're mine. Copy I'm just mine. Like, I'm like, this is these are cool bugs. <laughs> <laughs> the more complicated, the better. Like, <laughs> or the, maybe the more the more uh, the more dumb, easy, yeah. the better. I don't know. I uh, I I like. There's something about that like uh, really easy exploitation mm. aspect that really uh, is is so fun. It's that like it's just like oh wow, this really simple bug is like just out there elegant exploits are are, are very cool yeah. for sure Alrighty, man is that it for you we calling it a wrap there i think that's it that's a wrap all right that's the pod that's pod peace peace